Hello and welcome to the Sales Lab from Homebridge Financial, where we discuss the best sales ideas, strategies, and solutions for today's housing market. Our program is designed to share the best practices and market intelligence with builders and new home sales professionals so you can find success regardless of market conditions. Our host is Anthony Grass, National Sales Director for Homebridge Financial's Builder Division, who will lead in today's conversation. Subscribe to this podcast to bookmark this link so you can find your way back for future episodes. And now our host, Anthony. Hello, and welcome to the Sales Lab from Homebridge Financial, where we share the best sales ideas, strategies, and solutions for today's real estate market. My name's Anthony Grast, and I'm your host for today's program. As all of you are aware, 2020 has been a challenging year. You know, this year we witnessed the biggest shift in technology use and adoption as all sales went online. For our builders, we had to adapt how to sell homes online. But for our buyers, it was equally as difficult because they had to adapt how to purchase homes or explore homes online. The big question during this shift is did customer satisfaction decline? How big did it decline? Should we even be looking at customer satisfaction this time? One of the most important questions I have is what can we do to improve the customer experience, thereby improving our sales from referrals? These are all big questions. And today we're going to answer them with the help of Bob Merman. Bob is our guest today. Bob is CEO and founder of Alliant, and he's also authored over 100 articles on the home buying experience. For those of you who aren't familiar with Alliant, Alliant's been in business for 36 years and works closely with customer-centric companies that want to deliver exceptional experience and turn their customers into referral generators. Bob works with over a thousand builders in North America and I believe also in the Middle East as well. So he's a wealth of knowledge in this arena, and I'm looking forward to hearing his insight on today's program. Bob, welcome to our program. Hey, thank you, Anthony. You know, I, I want to start off by thanking you for inviting me here today to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, and that's the customer experience and improving that, because the whole point of that um, is to help builders sell more homes from referrals, and that's where we're going. But, you know, I just a personal point, I've always been a big fan of yours, Anthony, since I first met you about almost 10 years ago um, and became even more so a fan when I saw the Home Street Bank ratings and you were directing the customer experience, of course, at Home Street Bank and now are uh, at Homebridge. And we're seeing the same positive uh, scores on your lenders that we've seen before. So you're obviously ha- making an impact. You walk the walk. And because of that, I am delighted to be here today. So we have a very intriguing title about not paying attention to customer satisfaction. Forget about customer satisfaction. There's a better strategy than this. Than right. this. And that's not to say that I am not interested in satisfying home buyers. I mean, I'm interested in having satisfied customers. But I, because satisfied customers are a heck of a lot better than dissatisfied customers, there's no question about it. The issue is satisfied customers do not directly impact your referral rates. And that's something we have to consider. If our goal is to generate more sales from referrals, and that's what it is, satisfied Mm -hmm. customers do not go out and passionately, proactively bring their friends into your sales office. And now if you ask them, did they have a good experience with XYZ Builder? They they might say, yes, I did. But to my perspective, that's that's a review. That's not a referral. A referral is when you grab your friend by the scruff of his neck and drag him into the sales office. That's a referral. That's passionate referral. And the only way you can get people to be that passionate about making a referral is not to satisfy them. If you satisfy them, you've given them what they expected. To delight them is the next level. And that's what we're aiming to do by offering them the unexpected, the extraordinary. An extraordinary customer experience is what we're really out for. In fact, if you take a look at our data over the years, we've been able to validate that a delighted homeowner, a home buyer, is six times more likely to be strongly willing to refer with passion than a satisfied buyer. 
Now, that's a significant difference. If you can move people from satisfaction to delight by doing some of the things we're going to be talking about specifically today, um, you have a better chance of selling more homes from referrals. And there's no reason why, for instance, you can't, there's no reason why you can't be in the top rung of sales from referrals. Our best builders are 48 to 50% of their sales from referrals. We average about 26%, but we have many in the 30s and even in the 40s and the high 40s. Um, so there's no reason why you, why you can't sell. And what does that mean to your marketing budget when you're selling 30, 40, almost 50% of your homes from referrals? It's a significant improvement that all of your sales people would stand up and applaud were they to get those, those kinds of percentages. So we're after an extraordinary experience, not just an experience which satisfies buyers. That's the strategy. Yeah, I was I was reading one of your recent articles and you, and you were talking about don't focus on that when you were talking to the builders and lenders. And so that explains it. We want to deliver an extraordinary experience. We want to delight, not just measure a satisfaction. Yeah. But I, I'm always I'm always intrigued. You have incredible data, which also means you have incredible response rates to your surveys. Yeah. So how I mean, you know, I. I don't always respond to surveys. I'm honest. I don't always respond to surveys. Neither do um, I. I'm not buying house all the time. But how do you get how do you get these buyers to respond at, at such a high response rate? Well, you know, I guess part of the secret sauce here is that we've been doing this now for 36 years. So we've picked up a couple of pieces of knowledge about how to get people to respond to our surveys. It's in our it's our entire business. Um, in measuring the customer experience. Part of the issue here, Anthony, is that, as you just mentioned, we're, we're being bombarded today by surveys every time I go out to do a takeout order locally here, or I, I fly in an airplane, or I eat in a restaurant, or I do all the normal things that we do, just go shopping for food. I, they have my email address, and they send me a, 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 a short uh, survey, poorly written, I might add, but the survey is there. So we're competing here in Eliant and companies like myself, our, our, our company. We're, we're competing with all these other types of surveys. We have to stand out. So there are, there are two basic ways to get um, higher response rate. And there's two players in this. One is Eliant. The other is our client. So Eliant does a lot of things to generate a higher response rate. It's the way we present the survey, the way we introduce it, the letter that, that we write to talk about the importance of the survey, the shortness of the questions, the shortness of the questionnaire. So we have short questionnaire with relatively short questions as well. Easy to fill out, attractive looking um, emailed um, evaluations that we're asking buyers to fill out. Um, and um, it comes in 21, their buyer's choice of 21 languages. So there's no objection if, a, and we have so many um, ethnicity issues about surveys from people all over the country now. It's just not in the Southwest anymore. It's spread out all over the country. So we have surveys in every possible language. We just added Russian about a week ago because we have a client in Seattle um, who has a significant number of Russian um, people who are buying homes and why should we leave them out? So we translate our surveys into Russian as well. And that helps to get back another four or five percent on our response rate. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we have a, a very, very refined system in terms of sending out reminder emails in which they can choose their, their language as well. We have a sweepstakes drawing. There's a lot that we do for people who respond to the surveys and that helps. That's our part. You know, and that's okay. a very sophisticated process um, full of, of research that we've done from a psychological perspective and everything else. So th that's our part. But probably the most important part is what our builder clients do and our lender clients do in terms of communicating with their buyers the importance of them participating as a feedback participant in this. Um, we know that there are some of our clients that average 80, 85% and more in terms of response rate. And there are some that average 55. Well, there's a world of difference between what the clients are doing when they get 85% versus what they do at 55. The ones that are doing 80, 85% and more are following to the letter 
the training that we offer, the information, the checklists, the video training that we have on our site for our clients that says, here's how to do it. Here's how to get a higher response. And if you do those things to the letter, as many of our clients do, and listen, it's not easy. It, it takes some dedication. It takes some right. discipline. But when you do it, like anything else, it works because we've tested it hundreds and hundreds of times. We know exactly what our best clients are doing. And the ones who are getting uh, response rates that are 50 to 60 percent, that's OK. It's not a bad response. We like 80 better because it's a more because the response is spread out and we can look at individual representatives ratings with a lot more credit, a lot more credibility on that as well. So there's a lot that you can do. One of the first things I would suggest that as a builder who's visiting this podcast today is the check the way that you set expectations for your buyers about what you're going to be doing regarding your request for them to evaluate your, your experience. In some cases, like in our case, we have three, four, five times that they're going to be asked to evaluate some aspect of the customer experience. And that's something you don't want to keep secret. Um, mm -hmm. Any buyer, any one of your buyers that gets um, an evaluation from us or from anyone else and is surprised by it is much less likely to respond to that, to that survey opportunity. So set expectations and be honest about it. Secondly, don't press for scores. Don't let your, your representatives press your buyers to give them all 10s. And if you can't give me a 10, call me and I'll, I'll do something to, to fix the situation. It's not the score that should be important to your buyers. And your buyers will tell you this. They tell us all the time. If, they were, if that builder was as interested in my satisfaction, in my referral, mm -hmm. as they are in getting a 10, this holy grail 10, we'd all be better off. So it's not the, the communication to your buyer is not about the score. It's about being honest. And our message right. to our, and the way we train them is we say, we tell them, we tell builders and lenders and whoever else we're working with to say to their customers, whether you are disappointed or delighted, we need to hear from you and we need you to be honest. So don't, don't hold back. Um, don't allow your customer reps, field reps, sales reps, design center, superintendents to call buyers who give bad ratings and ask them, why did you do that? I thought we, we satisfied you. Don't ever do that. What you've done there is to create a credibility issue um, that won't go away. That buyer will never fill out another survey for you. So if that happens on the first survey, forget about the second and the third, whatever you're, whatever you're doing. Um, we draw winners for a sweepstakes from all the participants uh, mm -hmm. who send surveys in. Publicize the winners. Let everybody know who won because the next time the, someone else gets a survey and it says we have a sweepstakes, they're going to believe it. Let them know. Publicize it. Put it on your website. Um, we have a question on every survey that says, do you want to be contacted by a representative of this builder for any reason? If they say yes to that question, you have to respond within 48 hours once you get it. And we send out our copies of every survey within hours after we get it. So with 48 hours later, there needs to be a contact with that buyer who says, contact me. And that's critically important because the next time that that buyer uh, fills out a survey and it says, do you want to be contacted? They're going to believe it. And if they need to be contacted, they need to know that you're reading all every right. one of these evaluations. So incredible response rate. I love your process. I really like your process in terms of, you know, we see over and over again, builders who don't have process on a lot of different areas, you don't get the results. 80% yeah. plus is a phenomenal response rate, even 50 or 60. I wish I had that yeah. on our surveys yeah. as, uh, as well. Now, you've written a lot of articles and I've noticed in the articles, you talk about a lot of different phases of the purchase experience from the in very initially walking into the model to the delivery. So for our builders, is there one phase that they should really focus on that is highly correlated to a willingness to refer uh, to a buyer's willingness to refer um, another customer to them? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, after we've, we've surveyed almost 3 million homeowners now, in the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, there's a lot of information coming in. Our, our, data our, our database is just complete 
with fantastic information about what to do. Um, and we know now through our research, and we work with the University of Southern California, USC, Marshall School of Business, who does our statistical analysis. So they can, they've told us what the most important issues are and what the most important questions are. So we direct our, our clients to those issues first. And a new client, we, we direct them to the low-hanging fruit, which is mm -hmm. home delivery and the lender process. Now, with all respect to what you do uh, you know, at, at HomeBridge, and did before at, at Home Street, Anthony. You, as, you and I both agree that that the lending process is problematic. That there are many mm -hmm. out there which are not providing a great service. Um, and so we focus initially on that. If it's if the scores are low, and almost ninety percent of the time, I would say, when we start a new client, the lender scores are problematic. So we start with that. We start with the low hanging fruit. But for mm -hmm. for but for clients that have been using this for a while. Not only do we focus on home delivery, which is the lowest typically mm -hmm. um, across the board, it's our lowest rated phase of the customer experience and lending and third followed uh, by design center. So you, though you got those three, home delivery, lending and design center, which create the most angst. Uh, once a, a new client has resolved some of those issues that we focus on initially, then we start talking about broadening the perspective and going over to the sales area and construction issues as well. But home delivery um, is an area that we have really developed some special um, skills in working with our builders to improve that. Now, you, when you mean home delivery, you mean delivering the final home, correct? The final walkthrough going through, showing them the home, delivering the keys. That's what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, it's, right? listen, it's, it's, the, it's the most important question that a buyer asks at contract. The last thing a buyer is going to know is, or the first thing, depending on who it is, when can I move my family into this new home? We're so excited. Mm -hmm. It's the first big question. And it's the first major promise that that salesperson has to make. Um, and there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. So it, basically, you have you have two issues. You can you can improve your customer's delight. You can create customer delight in two ways. That's it. Two ways. You can either perform exceptionally well, or you can change the perceptions of your buyers about the process. So making a promise is an effort to change perceptions, to mold perceptions about that, and that's part of the issue. So. Even when you have a situation like home delivery in which it's that's, that's in terms of delivering a home complete and clean on time, it's a very difficult process. It's rarely one in which you can deliver 100 percent of your homes as promised. So in, with that in mind, it's all about changing the perceptions of the people that you're selling homes to. So they understand that there that there can be delays and your transparency in communicating that during mm -hmm. the construction process is paramount to managing that kind of, of uh, perception change. So most of our builders have a system uh, for communicating the schedule. I think that if you take a look at the what's typically done, and there's some variance here, obviously, but at contract, you, uh, prom many builders promise a quarter next year. We're going to have your home delivered during the second quarter of 2021. And then when you get to some, um, you're breaking ground or you're trenching or whatever it is, um, and you have a, a, a trigger point. At that point, you say, okay, not just second quarter, but uh, May of next year. Now you narrow it down to the month. And then 60 days prior to the closing, you can narrow it down to the week. And then 30 days prior to the closing, you narrow it down to a day. And when you find now your system may be entirely different because you have custom homes or you have semi custom homes or you're multifamily, there are different variables here to play with. But to have a system like that where you're continuously getting focused and focused on a specific day um, makes a big difference. Now, here's the new twist that I'd like to suggest. When you get into a system like that or you're using one right now, keep track of the accuracy of your promise. If you're making promises at at um, groundbreaking, whatever it is, and it says we're going to do it in a specific, we're going to close your home in a specific month. What percent of the time are you actually meeting that? 
That's good for you to know, but it's more important for your future buyers to know so that when you make that promise, you can say, over the last year, we've been tracking how well we've been doing on making this promise, and we made it 92% of the time. That gives them confidence, and it's a credibility boost for you as well. So mm -hmm. the final word here on, on uh, scheduling and home delivery is be transparent. You're going to have delays. Let's face it. Nothing works perfectly all the time. You're going to have delays. When you have those delays, don't keep it a secret. Don't let the buyer find out about it by, by serendipity or from talking to one of the neighbors. Let them know what the situation is and keep them transparent. Uh, absolutely. And I'll just add just one quick note. And you talked about lending, you know, routinely the, uh, the things that I see in surveys about a bad lending experience is simply two things. They didn't explain the process. Yeah. They didn't yeah. stay involved. Staying involved means proactive communication, outreach, updates, really setting that. And that's what I see at my end. So it doesn't it surprise me that home delivery and lending truly are uh, the most difficult parts of the home buying experience. Now, Bob, in a lot of your articles, and I've heard in several of your speeches, uh, this, you get very specific, the specificity of your recommendations for how to, how to improve. So for all of our listeners today who are in new home sales or builders, you know, we talk about behaviors, right? What are the behaviors we should be exhi exhibiting? Yeah. Is there one specific behavior they should be focusing on to really help improve this uh, customer yeah, experience. Yeah, there, 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 there are. I mean, there is. Um, and let me give you a little bit of background on this. We work, as I said, with the USC Marshall School mm -hmm. of Business to do our statistical analysis. So we know how impactful every question is on every survey and evaluation that, that we administer. We know some questions have much more impact on future sales and willingness to refer than others. In fact, we've narrowed it down based on this. USC analysis, there are seven mm -hmm. specific behaviors by staff members in sales, construction, finance, design, and customer service in those five areas. There are seven skills, behaviors, observable behaviors that have the biggest impact. I'm not a big guy. I'm not a big proponent of attitudinal stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I used to be a therapist and in that psychological role, if you're trying to get people to change their behavior, you can't talk in generality. Um, there was a there's a famous story about a therapist who welcomed a, uh, a middle aged couple in for marital therapy. And they came into the office and he asked the, the, the wife, which is the proper thing to do first, because this is the wife who typically starts this process. Why are we here today? And she went on this 20 minute rant about how insensitive and unloving her husband is and went on and on. And he let her go And at the end of the 20 minutes. He didn't want to be vague in general. So he asked her to stand up and he went over and he embraced her and he kissed her passionately in front of her husband. And then she, he asked her to sit down and he turned to the husband and said, this is what your wife needs three times a week. Can you do this? And the husband looked up and said, well, I can drop her off here on Mondays and Wednesdays, but on Fridays I play golf. But there was an effort to be specific. This is what needs to happen. Not you need to get more in touch with reality, you know, some kind of general term. So we in this field, working with builders and lenders and everybody else in the home building industry, we need to be specific. You can't change behavior unless you're, you're specific. So we have seven things. I can't concentrate on all today. There's no time. But in each of the different phases, there's one or two things. The most important one. If you walk away from this discussion today with only one idea of that you're going to change, one behavior you're going to change in your teams, it's this. The question is, were you kept, the question to, to the buyer, were you kept informed of construction progress? And now here's the key five words, without your having to ask. That's the key. You said it earlier, Anthony, it's proactive communication, not just responding to telephone calls. Also, very important, you can't do without it, but you have to be proactive about communicating, transparent and proactive. So of those seven referral drivers, as we call them, this is our list of referral drivers, and we report on this 
through one report that we have in our system to summarize it for every one of our clients. But the one issue is that proactive communication. So for most of our clients, it's the salesperson who is responsible for doing that. In about 15 to 20 percent, it's the superintendent. And at about 5% of the time, it's a combination of the superintendent and the salesperson. And our suggestion is, is that you make a call, an email, or a text to every single one of your buyers during the, in the entire escrow period or construction phase at least once every two weeks. Many of our clients do it once a week. Those are the highest rated, highest rated clients we have. They really are dedicated to it. Whatever you decide to do in this, in this regard, never promise your buyers that you're going to be calling them on a weekly basis or a two week basis, or I'm going to be calling you every Friday. You're just digging a deep hole that you may fall into. And it's not something that, that you want to do. So never promise you're going to do it. Just do it. And it doesn't matter who makes the call or sends the text, the salesperson, the construction agent, somebody else who is involved in this process can make the call to give them an update. It's not the person who calls. It's the fact that you're calling to do it and just leave a message on their phone. You don't need to have a right. conversation. It's just about communication. Yeah, that's great advice, proactive communication. And I think you actually taught me that. <laughs> proactive communication is, is highly valued. It also simplifies your life because you're not having all these emails and phone calls and things coming in. If you're proactive to oh, people, yeah. it really um, keeps them happy and also simplifies the salesperson side as well. Um, and by the way, not to interrupt here, but if you're getting calls, if you're a salesperson or you're a sales manager and you know that your team is getting a lot of calls about questions, your superintendents are getting calls about status and progress and construction, um, that's just the red flag that is being waved in your face to let you know that you're not doing a good enough job with that specific buyer in terms of keeping him or her informed proactively. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you'll find that the number of calls coming in declines rather significantly. That's been our experience. Yeah. And that's actually a good, that's a wonderful net benefit, not just uh, making delighted customers, but also we're busy now. There's lots going yeah. on and not having that, those extra calls and emails coming in are actually a benefit uh, yeah. To, yeah. To, to the sales team, to everybody involved. So let's talk about the uh, elephant in the room. So we're all dealing with COVID. Uh, there's talks about vaccines. Um, eventually we'll get there. But for the past almost nine months, we've had to operate in this online environment, virtual environment for various uh, reasons. I believe it definitely will continue in some format. I mean, we will get back to face to face. But the last nine months, Bob, what have you seen change in the data? What has the data shown us both good and maybe areas for improvement? Well, let's take let's take a step back. Just there's a macro, there are a number of trends going on with, re, with regards to looking at the, the data that we're collecting. The, the macro trend, and we'll start with that. The macro trend is during heavy volume selling in our industry, customer satisfaction scores tend to decline. Mm -hmm. For all the reasons that you would think intuitively, builders get very busy. They're shorthanded. They can't hire enough quality people. There's not enough trades. I mean, all those mm -hmm. things happen and scores tend to decline in heavy volume times. When there's a recession, when there's a downturn in the market, scores tend to go up because now builders have time to to work with customers more on an even handed one on one basis. So that's the macro trend. So how do you mix that with what's going on in this wacky and crazy year that we've been going to that we're almost through, thankfully? Um, but wh how does it what's working out now? Well, as you might expect, when you go back to closings or purchases that occurred during March and April and May of this year, and you look at their data from the surveys that they returned, their scores dropped rather dramatically in terms of their satisfaction. But an interesting, not a corollary, but an interesting aspect of that is that when you read their comments, and we collect uh, an average of about eight comments per evaluation when buyers fill them out online. Uh, so we have a lot of information that we sort through in terms of their comments. An incredible number, a proportion, we never counted it, but a high proportion of the comments that came back from buyers filling out their surveys during that period were extremely empathetic. 
So that empathy lent itself towards higher ratings than you might expect. So although the scores were going down dur during this time, they mm -hmm. weren't as low as we had anticipated and we guessed wrong. We thought they would just fall apart when builders were finding it difficult, difficult to really manage the process now with COVID. They went down, but not dramatically. So they went down and through August. So for closings that occurred in August, which means that the buyers purchased April, May, somewhere in that time period, which was a bad period, their scores were declining. For buyers who started purchasing in June in that area and closed in September, October, November, now the scores are starting to come back. In fact, they've come back so far that the limited amount of data that we have so far for November, and we're just in the beginning of it, collecting in that period, are the highest ratings that we've ever seen. Now, it's a bit premature to come to any strong conclusions that November will continue to be that way. In fact, statistically, things tend to regress towards the mean. So they may go down a little bit, but they're not anywhere near um, the, the low points that we hit on closings um, during the late summer. So COVID has had a remarkable impact on consumers' uh, perception of the process. They're much more empathetic than I would have given them credit for. And builders uh, clearly have um, changed and, and improved their processes to deal with this unique situation in ways that we never would have expected. And as a result, uh, we haven't really lost anything now, six months later, eight months later. We haven't really lost anything now in terms of possible referral sales because of the empathy and the builders change and improvements in their processes. So that's where it is. And I, once again, we were taken a bit by surprise that it has worked out that way. Yeah. And, and, you know, you talk about, uh, I was thinking while you were talking about score improvement, you know, is that just simply people accepting the online experience or the virtual experience, or was there process improvement? And as you noted, there's definitely yeah. process improvement. Is that process at risk with the demand we're seeing today? So much demand, so many buyers, so many inquiries. Do you do you view that as a risk, or is that also something that just has to be managed proactively through through the process? I, you know, my my confidence in the builders that we work with, so many builders, my confidence in their ability to adjust and to manage the risk and to come up with strategies that they never would have thought of a year ago. Um, has been bolstered by the results that we're seeing and finding out what our customer customer clients, our clients are doing and have been doing to make a change in their system. So I'm not worried about it. I mean, take a look at the proportion of people, consumers that are spending time online today. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question that this is this process is not going away. This is the, there's some parts of this which will stay with us. Not only in terms of people, you know, the, the common thing is where, well, we won't have as many people working in offices today and home offices and in homes are the big thing and et cetera, et cetera. And spaces are going to be different. Designing our homes are going to be different. But just the way in people shop. I bought my most recent home online. I never saw it. And I bought it online and we never saw it until 60 days later. We never went into the home. It was a resale. Um, we didn't see it for 60 days after we bought it. Um, so it was my introduction into that process and it's worked out extremely well. Well, that's good. I mean, that's good to hear. And we're seeing more and more people, um, you know, buy online. Now is the process going to remain virtual? I don't think so. It's going to definitely be a hybrid, yeah. but it'll be a hybrid. People will do a lot of their research and front end work online. And if you have a great process set up, what you're really doing is compressing the sales cycle, being yeah. more efficient, uh, engaging your buyers, higher conversion rates by having that great online presence. So that's good to hear. So one thing I want to go back to, Bob, and this will be our final question, but I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, the lender experience being being really poor uh, for, for many, many buyers or the lowest rated part of that. Uh, experience. So you also see very good lenders in your data. And I'd be very yeah. interested in what are you seeing the, the highest rated lenders do that's creating, you know, delighted customers, uh, wonderful customer experience 
And also, I'm assuming their work also helps create sales for that builder as well. It should be. I mean, it's the builder. It's the builder that is the primary recipient of the, um, the way in which mm -hmm. the lender conducts his or her business. That's what we're trying to do: is create additional sales by 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 referrals. And so we have we we rate and rank a little over ninety five lenders across the country who are working with with builders. So if you take the just those lenders that we rate that have at least forty to forty, I think it's forty responses. Um, that means that we're not dealing with small lenders at this point. We're dealing with responses of surveys that we've sent out. So it's a significant amount, statistically and any any other way, any other way. We have 52 lenders that have at least 40 responses. So we can take a look at those. What's the high and what's the low? The lowest lender that we evaluate with 176 responses so far to our surveys, completed surveys to date. Their, their average score is 71% of overall satisfaction with their, with their lender. They would not refer people to that lender. Our best lender is the 52 with a, lot, with a large response. They have 216 responses so far this year. They're at 98%. 98% wow. over 216 people, you would think statistically that's not even possible, but it is. That's what they're doing. So that's the that's the range from 71 to 98, so mm -hmm. a 27 percent differential. What are they doing differently? They're doing the things that we're talking about now at the at the top end. And the one at the bottom end is just just basically lending money without caring how much impact it has on the builder's future business or on their own future referrals. When people want to do a refi, why would they go back to a lender that was only scoring in the low 70s versus finding somebody else who could offer a different level of an experience. So mm -hmm. it's a big differentiator um, and one which we take advantage of in our certification programs for lenders. I mean, we know that there, we, we, we do the surveys right after the close of escrow. We don't wait for the builder survey to come out. We want to make it differentiated, focus only on the lending experience within the first three days or four days after the closing. We ask seven or eight questions. And those representatives, those loan officers who score 85 to 90 percent, we call bronze certified. That means they're mm -hmm. they're a good level. They're higher than the average. We we don't like anything less than 85 percent is an, is not a good score. And those who score 90 to 95 percent are silver certified. And then when you get in that rarefied air at 95 percent and greater. Those, we only have 13% of our loan officers that we evaluate through our certification program, 13% that are gold certified. So it's a really, it's a high bar. The bar is very right. high, but that adds accountability to the process. Everybody who's bronze wants to be silver. If you're silver, you want to be gold. So you pay attention to the questions that are being asked on these surveys. So that's the differentiation. Um, it's, a, it's about accountability that the highest rated lenders hold their, their, their teams accountable because they have scores and a measurable mm -hmm. impact versus the ones at the bottom, they don't bother. And that's, that's a big thing. And everybody wants to be motivated by moving from bronze to silver, et cetera. So that's what makes a big difference. Every, everybody likes the trophy. So that's important. Yeah. We want to be, we want to be rated and graded. Why not take advantage of it? It's about ego. Why not use that to your, to your advantage and let them go up that scale? I think it's a wonderful yeah. thing. It's worked out extremely well. The bottom line is that the lenders that add value to the home purchase experience and don't detract from the experience by what they do. Those who add value create a different impression of the builder and those buyers will recommend their builder more likely than a, than if, if they had worked with a lender that created a negative experience. That's what lenders should be thinking about. How can I create more sale for these builders? Absolutely. Well, Bob, thank you so much for being on our program today. You gave us some incredible insight into where we should be focusing. And I, I it just resonates with me about you know creating an exceptional experience, delighted customers, and being proactive. And th this is the simplest, but yet mo most effective, being proactive 
with our outreach and communication. And I think that goes so far in terms of, you know, creating happy customers, yeah. really happy customers, delighted customers right. that then will refer, refer you on. So thank you for being on yeah, our program. My pleasure. Thank you, Anthony. Absolutely. For any of our audience that would like to uh, connect with Bob, you can do that at Alliant.com and you can see more about his company, his organization, some of the surveys, results, things that they're doing there. But on behalf of all of us here at the Sales Lab, thank you for listening today, being on our broadcast and have a great week. Thank, thank you. you.